Hey there, everyone. I am so glad that you're here. Today we are having a much tougher conversation than you're probably used to in this vlog. We're talking with Stephen Hammond, who is one of the leading experts in sexual harassment. He is a speaker, he's a lawyer, and he is the go-to expert that so many organizations leverage when they face a situation where somebody has been sexually harassed or they're investigating that. And you know, everyone, I feel really compelled to talk about this because I personally have experienced through LinkedIn and other ex even very recent experiences where there's little insidious examples of sexual harassment and I'm just sick of it. I don't wanna take it anymore. And so I wanted to bring on, and I'm sure you're not either. I wanted to bring Stephen Hammond into our conversations for two reasons. Number one, let's get real. What is sexual harassment and what are the subtle things that we're ignoring and we're tolerating and we don't wanna put up with it and tolerate, including as a business owner. And that's the second thing I wanna talk with all of you about today through Stephen's wisdom, is what can we do about it so that as wonderful employers that you are, we don't let it happen on our watch. So Stephen, thank you so much for joining us for one thing. I know you're a really busy guy. Um, could My you pleasure, share, <laughs> Could you share with us what is sexual harassment? How do we come to understand what this is, is particularly in Canada and what are some of the subtle forms that maybe a lot of us are putting up with or ignoring and we need to call it out? Sure. Well, it was on May the 4th, 1989, that the Supreme Court of Canada ruled of a case that was brought by two women who worked for a restaurant in Winnipeg called Pharaoh's. Mm -hmm. And they were terribly sexually harassed. They were groped by the um, cook and the managers never did anything about it. So the Supreme Court came up with a much more liberal definition to sexual harassment than the American Supreme Court who had done it previously. Mm -hmm. And they said the sexual harassment is something that is unwelcome or unwanted conduct or comment of a sexual nature that has some sort of detrimental impact on the workplace um, against the person who is being sexually harassed. Mm -hmm. So it's a very, it was a very liberal interpretation to include a lot of things because the same court at different times has said that sexual harassment, well actually should say human rights legislation as a whole, which sexual harassment is in, mm -hmm. is considered remedial legislation, not punitive. So you try and find a remedy. Now, mind you, if the sexual harassment is really bad and you find in addition to maybe having to pay someone 12 months pay in lieu of notice uh, because they left or you fired them and, and they were being sexually harassed, if you end up with, let's say, twenty five or $50,000 as punitive damages, that's going to seem quite punitive. But the whole purpose under Canadian law is how do we find a remedy? How do we get something to normal? And the whole notion of reasonableness is, is always comes up. It's like, okay, let's be reasonable. It doesn't, it doesn't mean that the woman who's being sexually harassed has to, okay, let's compromise a little bit. No, you don't have to put up with any sexual harassment, mm -hmm. but it means you need to come up with a good remedy. And it could be a person's going to be fired, but hopefully the best thing is someone's done something inappropriate and there's some sort of either discussion or discipline and the person who's being sexually harassed, she, and it's mostly she, it can happen to anyone, but it's mostly a woman. Um, she will say, yeah, I'm satisfied with that. That seems reasonable to me. Um, you know, this person is, has learned his lesson or, um, or, or I don't have to work with him anymore or whatever it is that's reasonable. That's what you try to come to that resolution of some kind. And as somebody who's been sadly on the receiving end of that many times in my career, I can think that probably would have done it for me. I just want somebody to be A, more aware and B, not do it to anybody else. So I'm sure you've found that in, in the situations that you've worked in, people just want it to stop happening. We don't need to, you know, ruin somebody's career. We just like, just stop it, stop it already, you know? Yeah. So, what, yeah. can, what are some of the subtle forms that are happening, though, that are still leaking through the cracks because people are not really seeing it as sexual harassment? What, what comes across your desk and you think, yeah, of course that's inappropriate, and people have been putting up with it for a long time? Well, actually, it's interesting. There's a wide range of what, again, women, mostly women in particular, there's a wide range of what women are still willing to put up with. And I say willing, meaning that they're not willing to come forward, they're not willing to rock the boat, say anything to the person directly, or if it's a boss, to say anything because the person has a position of power. <clears throat> so there's, there's still 
quite outrageous sexual harassment that goes on. And I don't mind saying that I, I continue to be surprised. I mean, I've been doing this line of work for, what is it, about 28 years or thereabouts. And um, when I left law and um, employee relations and just started doing training and educating mm -hmm. and coaching with people about these issues, how to bring about change. And, and it's the kind of stuff in which I really thought by this time we would mm -hmm. be a lot further and we're not. Now, mm -hmm. that being said, there's a lot of guys who have learned their lesson. There's a lot of guys who have changed their ways um, and that's a very positive thing. But the mere fact that you still have women who are being hit on and the example that you told me about what's going on with LinkedIn, I said to you, I, I must, you know, this is my field of expertise and I didn't realize this was going on, for example, LinkedIn. Well, certainly I don't get it. So, you know, it doesn't come my way. No one ever comments about how attractive I am. And, um, you know, I don't have to put up with that kind of crap. Mm -hmm. And the fact that you're telling me that that's going on at LinkedIn, where those, these things can be monitored very easily, still lets us know there's a lot of people who've got to learn a lot more lessons. Yeah. But there's also the subtle things are about, uh, let's say, the comments about someone's looks. You wouldn't do that with a guy. Under, under you know, 99 times out of 100, mm -hmm. no one is going to say that about a guy to sort of undermine his credentials. Mm -hmm. And so it's where women, you know, constantly have to decide and monitor, what do I say? What do I do? I mean, I, I remember, well, reading mm -hmm. uh, Hillary Clinton's book um, after she lost. And when she was talking about when Donald Trump was hovering over her during one of the debates, and he was almost like, you know, he was sort of stalking her. And she was thinking in her mind, she, she revealed, she, she was thinking, I knew he was there. I knew he was doing this to intimidate me. And I wanted to just say, back off, buddy. But then she said, as a woman who is way more, way more qualified than he would ever be, mm -hmm. she said that her concern was, how would it look for a woman to be saying that, even though you have this really creepy guy who is making these kind of comments, or sorry, or in this particular case is just sort of standing behind her and lurking. So if you've got someone who's one of the most powerful women and she's thinking, gee, you know, I have to be careful about what I do, then there's an awful lot of women who don't have the same power as let's say, you know, even Hillary Clinton mm -hmm. to be able to speak up. And so there's still an enormous amount of reluctance and where people do feel comfortable, the best thing you can absolutely do is just correct someone on that. And, and, and one of the things, and someone taught me this many, many years ago, and she didn't teach me as a lesson, but she just, she just said, why would you say that? <laughs> and it was the best thing. And I wasn't coming Great on to her, response. but yeah, it, was just, it, was something, it was something else. And, and I learned that that's one of the best things is you can say, why would you say that? One of the things that I learned on my own <clears throat> is that I often say to someone, could you repeat that please? And I don't do it in any you know, snide way. I just very sincerely say, could you repeat that? And the interesting thing is if someone was doing some smart ass comment, um, it was smart ass the one time when you just very calmly, coolly and collectively say, um, could you, you know, just repeat that? Then they know they've been caught. And usually then it's a bidi, 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 you know, well, I meant this or it didn't mean that. Oh, I said, no, look, all I'm asking you for you to do is repeat it again, please. Mm. And, it's and a way of calling somebody out without it having to necessarily be aggressive or if, if somebody is questioning and evaluating, did I understand that correctly? And they have their own filter of maybe, maybe it's me, maybe I misinterpreted it. It's a great way of being able to still stand for your power without having to step so into the arena that you feel really vulnerable. It's a great strategy. Well, but there's a lot of things that people can do just for them to feel comfortable. But also, if you feel you want to, as you're saying, get in the arena, get into that arena. Mm -hmm. um, there, there's a lot of guys who still don't get it. Um, when I, I, I just got off a call um, with a client of, of some session that I'm going to be doing in a couple of weeks. And, um, you know, and I was saying, well, can you give me examples? And, you know, it's all confidential, but can you give me examples? And, and you know, where someone would still say, oh, well, boys will be boys. And I thought, people are really saying that in the workplace. Uh, it's just, it's still one of those surprises. And so that's where it's just very important for then, let's say a woman gets that and she gets to say, look, boys can be all the boys they want. I don't want to put up with that. Or I don't want the women in my workplace to put up with that. So would you get the boys uh, to become men, please? And yes. stop saying those kind of things. Oh, I love so, that. Let's get the boys to become men. I love that. <laughs> hey, I just came up with that. Um, um, somebody told to put me, a bumper sticker. I, if you, if people have daughters 
one of the the piece the feedback that I've received because you know as I was mentioning to you um, that I get a people connect with me through LinkedIn. So one of my responses is sometimes, and I no longer engage with them, I just block them, report them, hopefully LinkedIn sees them for what they are. But my response has been, would you be okay if somebody messaged your daughter with what you just said to me? And he or she may not have a daughter or sis may have a sister or something like that. It, we gotta put it in perspective that if you're treating me this way, you know I am a human being, right? And you're that, someone's daughter. That's where we get to. Yeah, you're someone's daughter. You're someone's sister, perhaps, or a, or you know, wife, or uh, you know, someone that you care about that you would never want that to be mm -hmm. going towards anyone else. And they need they need to be thinking that you are just as vulnerable as anyone else, and and you shouldn't have to put up with these things. So, yeah, the subtle stuff that goes on, you can still just ask people to explain themselves. Mm -hmm. um, but I also think that that if someone just wants to be really direct and just say, look, that's inappropriate, please don't do that again, mm -hmm. and then move on. Or, or, or if you have to deal with it in some way, if there has to be more consequences, then, then you deal with it. But it's just bringing it to light. And the difficulty is for all the years that I have been working is that I have learned that fitting in is the biggest deal for mm -hmm. us as a species. And so we will do an enormous amount to fit in. And as a result, we'll do a great deal not to rock the boat. Mm. And so the biggest barrier that um, anyone who's watching this, um, most of us have, is that we're just not willing to speak up. And so like there's, there's many, many times I can be doing a one hour keynote or I can be doing a half day or full day session with people and I can give them all the education that I've got and I can cite all the very interesting cases uh, that I do. And yet I say, look, I can get you to that door, but I can't get you through that door. Like you, you've got to go through that door. You've got to be the one that has sort of got to count to 10 or take a deep breath and decide, hey, I'm just going to say something, I'm going to do something. And the reason why in, in particular for sexual harassment is that a lot of women don't do anything is because they know that there's going to be consequences if they do. And so that's where it's just got to be very clear that you haven't done anything wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, many of the cases that I cite across Canada, um, there's examples where women have brought stuff forward and then they're the ones who are punished. They're the ones who are ostracized or fired or something along those lines. And because we know that that's going on, and especially you take something like this pandemic, Mm -hmm. which makes um, employment even more tenuous mm -hmm. because there's a lot of people who are out of work or maybe modified hours, i.e. reduced hours. And when you look at the personal debt even before the pandemic, mm -hmm. and then with what's going on now, is that people aren't willing to take any chance. They're, yeah. they just, they're not willing to take the risk. And the interesting thing is, under most circumstances, if you speak up, your workplace is going to do something about it. They really are because they're not willing to put up with this. And one of the things, and we've seen this through the Me Too movement, we've seen it through Black Lives Matter, is that now people are getting in big trouble when they are posting stuff that is inappropriate. And so, as a matter of fact, in the old days, the higher up you were, the more protection you got. Mm -hmm. And that's not, the, that's not the case now. The higher up you are, if you do something that's inappropriate, they're going to knock you and your entire company down. So that just means that there's, there's not a lot of tolerance for inappropriate things, whether it's sexual harassment or racial discrimination or anything along those lines. And I even saw that with people's support when I started being really out there about, and I stopped worrying about my brand and will people not think I'm a recognition expert if I'm calling people out for their inappropriate behavior on LinkedIn. What I found was a lot of people saying, it's been happening to me too. Thank you so much for saying this, or I hadn't realized that this was actual sexual harassment, but I realized why emotionally it causes me stress sometimes to open up LinkedIn because I might see this. One of the greatest things that we can do is that we can, to build that sense of community is to say, I've been through that too. Or, hey, this is something that happened to me and I'm just, I'm sharing it and I'm not cool with it anymore. Um, because then we realize how many other people are going through, have gone through, may go through. And if we need a reason, do it for your, the people that you're mentoring coming up, do it for your daughters, do it for your sisters, do it for your sister-in-law. 
Um, do it in community so that it builds, remember that you're not doing it alone. And sadly, you probably weren't the only person that has been on the receiving end of this as well. As well. Do you have any other advice that helps women and employers and leaders get really powerful about actually truly addressing this on the long term? Well, when you gave the list of who they should be doing it for and all of them were women, you're right. That's who you should be doing it for. But you should be engaging men and mm -hmm. you should because for the most part, the women aren't going to be doing the sexual harassing. I mean, it, it, it does happen, but for the most part, it's, it's where it's men. And, and so that's where you have to be saying to men in your workplace mm -hmm. um, that you need to be on side with this. Like you need to change this. And, and if someone else is making the comments and you're concerned about, you're not going to fit in with the guys, well, you need to do better than that. Um, mm -hmm. Then this is not one of those times where fitting in is going to be the most important thing. So it's, it's, and, and again, most guys are, most guys get it. Most guys recognize when something is inappropriate and when it's not. Mm -hmm. And, and, and yet still there might be the difficulty because it's awkward. Uh, it might be done in a, in some sort of sense of humor that someone else is saying, Hey, that's not, um, that's not funny. Or if mm -hmm. it is funny, it's at someone else's expense and that's not appropriate. Yeah. And so the more that you can get the other guys to speak up as well, that's very powerful because it comes from the guys and they can't, you know, if someone just wants to be inappropriate and just say, oh, well, that was that woman, she can not handle this kind of stuff, which they don't have the right to do. But even if they say that, they can't say it with a guy. Yeah. And so if one of the men were to speak up and say, look, that's inappropriate, let's just move on. And, and you know, earlier on, that's what you had actually said to me is that for a lot of people, they're just, you know, a lot of women are saying, just stop doing it. And that's the interesting thing is most people aren't looking for a pound of flesh. Some people mm -hmm. are, and, and, and sometimes you need to get it because it's so inappropriate. Mm -hmm. But most people just want to say, I don't want to deal with this. I don't want to deal with these kind of inappropriate comments again. I don't want to deal with this kind of discrimination. Let's move on. And that's the interesting thing is that for most people, is that it's amazing how much they're willing to, whether, whether they forgive or not, they're willing to just say, I'm going to put this behind me. And mm -hmm. as long as this person has learned from it, then mm -hmm. I'm not going to go any, any further with it because it's taken care of, you know, it's thank you very much. That was done. It was inappropriate. And we got to, uh, we got to address it. Yeah. The, you know, the, the interesting thing is, is because of, I'm becoming a bit of a political junkie or well, I studied politics from when I was young um, is that, the the tagline of the Washington Post, which I seem to be sucked into watch, reading every day, says, "Was it uh, democracy dies in darkness?" Mm -hmm. And and the same is true of that if we don't speak up, if we don't fly, um, shine a light on the kind of sexual harassment and even some of the subtle things that are going on, then it gets to thrive. Mm -hmm. And so the thing is that the more that uh, something is happening, and if you don't feel comfortable to speak up yourself, then find someone who can. You know, we're, we're both self-employed, so there's, you know, there's only, we can't go to another boss, mm -hmm. but we can talk to, let's say, someone who we're dealing with, um, you know, someone amongst our clients, for example. Mm -hmm. So wherever you are in the work situation, there's usually mm -hmm. someone who wants to address this, and most people don't want to put up with it. Like most HR people certainly want to uh, stop this kind of stuff, and the head of an organization would be appalled to find out this is going on, in most circumstances they are. So you bring it to light. And when you do that goes a long way. Yeah. Even this was exactly why I wanted to spend time together talking about this, because as much as I would love all day long to spend my time talking about recognition and, you know, retention and all of the positive, healthy parts of workplaces, I would be doing a disservice if we didn't also acknowledge that there's a lot of things we're still fixing, this being one of them. Thank you so much for sharing your expertise with us. And we will definitely put in the section below how people can get, can get a hold of you. And also, if they're really serious about raising awareness and what to do about it, you have some amazing uh, programs for them to be able to take. So I can't wait to let people know how they can access that. Thank you, thank you for what you do, for dedicating your career to this and for helping us all collectively call out behavior that you're right, should have been over a long time ago, but it's still happening. So thank you. My pleasure.